All right, so this last section uh, of the review is about special collections. There are special tests that you have to be at least informed about, knowledgeable about, that you may not perform, but you have to know. Uh, peripheral blood smears is one of them, okay? Uh, what equipment is needed and what technique is used for peripheral, peripheral blood smears? So a peripheral blood smear, okay, is uh, a, a sample usually collected from my lavender, okay? If you collect it from a lavender, this test has to be done within one hour, okay? I believe I've seen this question before, okay? Uh, the purple blood smear has to be done using two slides, okay? One you have when you put your specimen and the other one's called the pusher slide. I think we practiced a little bit. It's not easy, but there are machines that do this uh, peripheral smears perfect every time. So we don't have to worry about that, but you have to know what it is and, and how to do it. Usually you put a place a drop of blood on the first slide, and um, you bring a second slide, and you bring it close to the blood, uh, blood drop, and the blood runs to the side, and you about 30 degree angle. In one single slide, you push the blood forward, and you should create a smear going from, very, from thick to very, very thin. The edges of the smear should be very thin, that they should be about one cell layer, right? So, so it's super thin. That, this is where the lab technicians are uh, going to count and evaluate the size of the cell, the amount of cells, and so on, okay? But again, you collect the specimen in the lavender, the lab technicians will usually uh, perform this, uh, this blood smear, but at least you know what it is and how it's done. What type of sample blood is needed? Usually it's going to be a, um, a plasma sample because it's an anticoagulant on a, an EDTA, which is your lavender, and you have to do it within one hour, so remember that. How do you prepare for a blood smear? I just went through it. Again, it has to be from thick to thin. The edges must be smeared and the slide must be covered at least two thirds, okay? Two thirds uh, with the smear. That would be an acceptable smear. Anything that would not be correct. Now, the next topic is blood cultures. This is very important topic because they're very common. They're one of probably one of the most common exams that are done during um, during the work area. Okay, so you have to make sure that you are familiar with blood cultures, what they are. Now, let me tell you, the, one of the most the most important part of blood cultures is skin prep. Okay, you use chlorhexidine gluconate to prep the site. Right. If you have a manufactured one that already has it, you break the seal and you're going to scrub the area about two inches in diameter, okay, for about 30 seconds or more. I'm sorry, yeah, 30 seconds, okay, or about a minute, 60 seconds, all right, in about two inches in diameter. So you prep the area, allow it to air dry. Remember, this is one of the, this is probably the most important part of the whole procedure, okay, when you're going to collect blood cultures. Now, why are blood cultures ordered? They're usually ordered for a diagnosis of fever of unknown origin, okay? If you come into the hospital, the emergency room with a fever that's been going on for days, that doesn't wanna go away, kind of like COVID, usually they're going to collect blood cultures. And I said in the, in the earlier um, reviews that these are ordered in sets of two, okay? You have your aerobic and your anaerobic bottle. Make sure, that you are collect those at once. Usually um, uh, they're ordered in sets. So one set is two bottles and usually the doctor will order them 30 minutes apart, sometimes 60 minutes apart from a different site. So if you go in with your first set, you collect your two bottles from the left arm, okay, possible. And then you come back in 30 minutes or an hour and you collect your other sample from the other arm. Okay, this is to minimize the risk. It's kind of like a control, right? To minimize uh, the risk of you uh, getting um, skin flora. Like if you don't do it uh, correct here the first time, you might do it here the second time. So that's usually why they ask um, for samples from different sites. Okay, so again, the diagnosis is a fever of unknown origin. Okay, so wh what do you do with the samples after you bring them in? Well, these samples are later than put in a, in a broth, right? In a medium where the bacteria, if there's any, will grow. It's placed any warmer, okay, and you let it sit there for about two, three days, and your final report will come in in three days, and it's gonna tell you if there's any bacteria. Now, you don't just do a culture, they also do what they call a sensitivity test, okay? What they're trying to do is uh, identify the type of bacteria that's growing, and then later 
um, try to kill it, applying different antibiotics to it. And the antibiotic that is the most effective at killing the bacteria is the one that we'll recommend to the physician. Okay, so it's a culture and sensitivity, blood cultures and sensitivity tests. That's what is done with the specimen that you bring in. Uh, what technique is needed? Sterile technique. You have to perform sterile technique and you have to do, use chlorhexidine gluconate. You collect blood cultures from usually the antecubital area and you can use either the ETS system or the, um, the butterfly. But if you use a butterfly, make sure that you use a discard tube. You do a discard tube to fill the tubing, the empty space with blood, and then drop it into the uh, collection bottles. You can use, I've used a syringe method. You can fill any of the, uh, the other tubes in any order. Okay, it doesn't matter. What equipment is needed to collect blood cultures and volume requirements for adults? Uh, for adults, usually every bottle requires 10 mLs, 10 mLs. And for children, usually requires about one mL depending on the size of the child. And you can look at the table on page 335 uh, for specific. Usually they take like one mL for the bottles. You cannot use pediatric bottles for adults or adult, you know, uh, adult bottles for, for little kids. It's, it doesn't work. Make sure you, uh, to choose the right ones. What is the order of draw and how do you prepare bottles for blood culture collections? Again, usually, depending on the device that you use, if you use syringe, you go with anaerobic, which means no air, and then followed by your aerobic, okay? If you use a, a, um, a butterfly, either use a discard tube and start with anaerobic, or if you don't use a discard tube, you make sure you use the aerobic first, okay? Hope that's not too confusing. Uh, blood donations. Blood donations and another procedure that is very, very common. Uh, what is the criteria for blood donation? Okay, this is important. You're gonna see it on the exam. On page 333, there are certain criteria that you must meet to be able to donate blood. And if you try to donate blood and you got rejected, the, they're uranemic, okay? That means that your hemoglobin was less than 12.5 milligrams per deciliter or your hematocrit was less than 38% if you're, if you're female. Okay, so hemoglobin and hematocrit are the two measurements, but also your weight. You must weigh at least 110 pounds and be at least 17 years old. Okay, remember 110 pounds is a cutoff. Any, anybody uh, below 110 pounds cannot donate any blood because we, they usually take about um, 500 millimeters of blood, milliliters of blood, and that's too much volume for somebody that is that, that small. Okay, they just don't have enough volume. They will have experiences of uh, you know, they get short of breath. And so that's why they have these requirements. Okay, so look over it on page 333. They will be on the test. How do you collect pediatric volume calculations? Uh, on page 451, uh, that's the table that we, uh, the math that we did earlier about the calculation. It's a 100 ml times the kilograms. So you have to convert the pounds to kilograms, multiply them, and then times percent, 10%. Never collect more than 10% at one single time. Okay, you will exsanguinate the, the, the patient. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, non-blood specimen collections. Non-blood, so it could be swabs, uh, sputum, urine. We talked a little bit about it earlier. Uh, collection of throat cultures. I think we all practice this here a little bit. Swab, swabbing the back of the throat, not the cheeks, not the tongue, right? But the back of the throat, including your tonsils. That is where you swab it, right? About three times. Nasopharyngeal, the ones going through your nose, up to the back of the pharynx, okay? Go in there and swab it about three times. Wound cultures are collected usually by staff members, usually nurses, okay? Uh, phlebotomists don't usually collect it, but the specimen has to be handled by the phlebotomist. So wound cultures uh, are usually collected by the, by the nurses. We usually clean the site first with a normal saline and then swab it with special culturettes. Okay, you can't just use any uh, cotton tip applicator. We have to use special culturettes that have a, a liquid, okay, they call it a fixator, so that the, uh, so there's no contamination on it, okay? So they go in a very uh, uh, a special um, wound culture tube. How do you perform throat culture? Where do you want to do that? Okay. Assisting healthcare professionals. This is kind of when you're going to be collecting non-blood uh, non specimens, but serous fluid specimens. We, we, we talked earlier that there's a lot of different kinds of specimens, such as 
uh, cerebrospinal fluid. We have peritoneal fluid, which is here in your, in your um, abdomen. Pleural fluid, pleural fluid is in your lungs, okay? Uh, you have um, the fluid that is around your heart as well. Uh, women that have that are pregnant have uh, am amniotic fluid, and they all look the same. It looks it looks uh, pale yellow, okay, and it looks just they all look the same. They look like plasma and serum. So what is your job? Your job is to make sure that you label the specimen again with the type of fluid and that you handle the specimen correctly. Does it need to be protected from light, or does it need to be uh, chilled, okay, or does it need to be kept at warm uh, temperature? So you have to know. Uh, those measures. But your job in assisting healthcare professionals is pretty much labeling the specimens correctly and handling the specimen correctly. All right, um, what equipment is needed when assisting other healthcare professionals with specimen collection, depending on, the, on the, the type of specimen? Most of the time, these specimens require a sterile, uh, sterile uh, containers, okay? Uh, obviously, you have to have your, the labels on them, okay? And make sure that you uh, handle them correctly. Blood spot collection, you will see questions on blood spot collections. Remember, these are the uh, tests that are done for newborns, okay? These are, these are the screenings that are done on the filter paper. Remember the paper with the little circles, okay? What is your job? What do you have to do? Well, number one, make sure that if you're gonna collect on a newborn, it has to be from the heel, all right? Make sure that you fill the circle with only one drop, you cannot apply multiple drops of blood to the paper, okay? Uh, you must ensure that the, that the blood drop goes all the way through to the backside of the paper, okay? Once you get all your circles filled completely, all right, uh, do not overfill, but don't underfill the circles. You must make sure that you lay these uh, filter papers on a flat surface, okay? Do not um, put one over another because when blood starts to dry, it will stick to anything. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to, you don't want to pile them one over the other. Make sure they're laid flat separate and you do not want to hang them to dry. You don't want to blow them dry or, you know, fan them dry or anything like that. Okay. You want to let the blood samples uh, dry by themselves. Uh, there are several um, screenings that are very common. You find uh, screenings for PKU. Please know what PKU is. Phenylketonuria, phenylketonuria, okay? That is a metabolic disorder on kids when they're unable to process um, phenylalanine, okay? Just know PKU, what, what it is. It's a test for uh, newborn screening, okay? It's, uh, it's a test that checks for uh, errors in metabolism, okay? And it means that your body cannot process phenylalanine, which is a protein that is in a lot of foods, okay? And if you're a a newborn and you can't process those proteins, that means you cannot process the milk that you're getting. Okay, so the, the child will end up with uh, uh, growth problems. You know, they won't grow correctly, especially in the brain, all right? So we have PKU, we have uh, hypothyroidism evaluations. We have, uh, what's the other one, the other common one? Hold on guys, let me remember. There's PKU, uh, hypothyroidism. Uh, there's one more I'm trying to think. Uh, remember it a bit. Anyways, the next question, how do you calculate volume requirements in patients who are a high risk for iatrogenic anemia? What is iatrogenic anemia? This is the type of anemia that patients uh, develop after multiple uh, blood collections, okay? iatrogenic anemia. You have to know this word because you're probably going to see it in the exam, all right? So this is anemia caused by multiple samples. If you have a patient that goes to one doctor and they draw blood and then goes to another doctor and they want to get their samples too and so on, by the time you know it, this person has developed iatrogenic anemia, okay? And normally when you're in a hospital, you can keep track of the amount of blood that a person is, uh, is, uh, has been given, uh, you know, through logs, okay? Or you do the formula that we did earlier, 70 times, um, times the kilograms, okay, times 10% for adults, or 100 times kilograms times 10% for, for babies. How do you prepare the skin for blood alcohol level collections? Well, we said that you do not use alcohol for sure, 
uh, either you clean it with benzoconium chloride, or if not available, you can use just soap and water. Okay, remember it's going to be collected in a sodium fluoride gray top. Uh, any questions on this section? Okay, so uh, getting back on the question for um, the filter uh, exams, the, the screenings, you have your phenylketonuria, which is PKU, you have your hypothyroidism, which is low functioning of your thyroid level, which affects your growth. And galactosemia, galactosemia checks for the ability of a, a person to, to convert a galactose into glucose. Okay, galactose is what you drink in the milk and then your body turns it into glucose, usable energy. And the last one is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, um, also called a sweat test, right, is to check for the abnormalities in uh, what they call exocrine glands, some of the glands or, you know, your pancreas, your lungs, they all produce mucus, right? Uh, like when you get sick, you produce mucus, that means those are your exocrine glands. Um, if they produce too much mucus, it actually impairs the ability of that organ. So cystic fibrosis is a test that's done also for, um, for small children when they're born to rule out this condition. It is a chronic condition. Um, usually cystic fibrosis um, ends up in kids, you know, dying after, you know, usually, you know, in the 20s, they don't go beyond that. So this test is done usually uh, on infants between 24 and 72 hours after they're born. This is cystic fibrosis. Another one of the, uh, the, the screenings that are done. All right, so that uh, pretty much is it for this section of the NHA review on special collections.